warmly welcome. I am so happy to see this fantastically huge crowd that in spite of the weather, you're all here. I'm Johan Tysk, I'm the Vice Rector for Science and Technology at Uppsala University. Um, this will prove to be, I think, an exciting afternoon about cosmos and mathematics. Maybe if we look up in the ceiling, I think there is some sort of sense of space and cosmos and mathematical symmetry. And, I've, and I think if you look inside your pocket, there is some space and cosmos there also. You probably have a mobile phone communicating with satellites based on mathematics. And the field of space engineering is growing larger and larger. But of course, what we will do today is not just the mathematics and the physics behind these technological innovations. It is something much deeper. It is the deep human interest in understanding our world and our universe. And the field of mathematical physics and geometry is very strong here at Uppsala University. And it is my pleasure to thank professors, e professors Ekholm, uh, Sabsin, and Menahan for organizing the conference String Math 2019. This conference has gathered the most distinguished researchers in the world to Uppsala this past week. And this conference was financed in part by the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. Now it is my pleasure to hand over the, the word to our own professor uh, Ulf Danielsson, who I think proves that to be an excellent uh, person in popular science, you also need to be an excellent scientist. So with this, please, Ulf, I, I give the word to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the relationship between physics and mathematics is an old one. It applies to me personally as well. As a kid, I really loved science, and I thought that mathematics, that is something really fun. So the choice for me was obvious. I should go into physics, in particular theoretical physics. Obviously also inspired by, let's say, Newton, who when he unified heaven and earth, had to, along the way, in invent the necessary mathematics, differential calculus. And from that day onwards, second order differential equations are indispensable tools. If you want to do science and engineering, you could even say that if you're not doing second order differential equations, you're not doing science. Now Einstein, when he struggled with putting gravity into relativity, he had to dig up almost for an almost forgotten branch of mathematics, Riemannian geometry, in order to get space and time to curve in the right way. And now, in our days, at the frontier of physics, of modern science, we have string theory, where almost all branches of mathematics come to some use and physicists are inventing new mathematics as they go along. But the relationship between mathematicians and physicists has not always been an easy one. Physicists think that mathematicians are so picky with all of those details. Can mathematicians really calculate anything? And mathematicians, they find physicists so unbearably sloppy. Do physicists really understand anything of what they are doing? Before I introduce the first speaker, 
Let me tell you a short story. In 1988, the Nobel laureate Leon Lederman in particle physics at his Nobel lecture told this story. So it's about two physicists out hi hiking. There's a theoretical physicist and an experimentalist. They get lost. The theoretical physicist, physicist obviously it had to be the theoretical physicist, pick up a map from the backpack. He looks at the map, scrutinize it carefully, look up, point towards a distant mountain top, and happily exclaims, that's where we are. <laughs> Finally, you got it. There was a bit of a hesitant, hesitance there. Now, today, we have the great pleasure, we'll be listening to two lectures, describing the relationship between physics and math. And the first one, we have the great pleasure to have someone, a physicist, who's already climbing that distant mountain. So, Professor Kamrun Waffa, currently a professor at Harvard University. He got his PhD from Princeton, he was born in Iran. He has written more than 200 papers on uh, string theory, the relation to math, and re revolutionized under our understanding of these subjects. He has received numerous prizes, like the 2017 Breakthrough Prize, Dirac Medal in 2008, and to his list of achievements, his long list of achievements, he will, in January, be able to add an honorary doctorate of Uppsala University. So, let us now welcome Kamrun, and who will now help us unravel the universe with the help of mathematical puzzles. Please. Well, first of all, thanks for such a uh, generous introduction. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here today and to give a lecture about the subject which is very dear to my heart, which is the connection between physics and mathematics. When it's ready to be seen, that's it. And here's another theoretical physicist getting lost. <laughs> so we need to have, a, to have some real engineer coming up and help us with the password. There we Perfect. Go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about um, a little bit first about my area of physics and how it connects to mathematics, and then tell you a bit more about some simple ideas of mathematics and how important simple ideas of mathematics can be for physics. So math and physics, as Ulf reviewed, has, have already had a huge amount of interaction over many centuries and millennia. And so maybe I should first start by uh, highlighting some of the interactions between the two subjects from the past. So in particular, we have uh, the Greek mathematicians who did quite an amazing amount of beautiful math, Euclidean geometry in particular, that was discovered by them, and they studied a lot of interesting things, and they were trying to actually understand reality based on the math. They were hoping that what they had discovered in mathematics would have consequences for real world. They discovered the beautiful platonic solids and their symmetries, and they thought symmetries must be important to describe reality. And so they thought these five objects, the platonic solids, have something to do with the five elements, air, earth, fire, water, and the universe somehow brought together these five elements. And so these ideas that symmetry is crucial is already ingrained in, in, in human mind from many years ago, and it still continues to the, today. Contra scientists, mathematicians, and uh, 
researchers from different cultures contributed, China, India, Islamic scientists here, I'm giving an example of how they try to use simple Euclidean geometry to begin to measure things having to do with the Earth. The radius of the Earth was measured using simple trigonometric ideas. The idea that suns, uh, the atmosphere has a finite height was already discovered a thousand years ago, and the idea was very simple. They, they studied, they said, well, uh, why is it that the, the light doesn't quite, the, the sky doesn't quite get dark as soon as we get sunset? Well, the idea was that the, there must be some atmosphere so that even though the sun is down, it's still hitting the upper layers of the atmosphere. And after a couple of hours, the, the sky would become completely dark. And based on that, they could measure the height of the atmosphere. And they already got a good measurement of the height of the atmosphere about a thousand years ago. So it's quite simple ideas of mathematics can already teach us some simple, uh, beautiful things about our universe. And uh, the, the progress in science got really to the next level in connection, connecting mathematics to reality by the work of Newton. Uh, the beautiful invention of calculus was necessary for Newton to actually describe the physics that he was observing. So Newton was a prime example of a physicist who invented math to ki kind of answer his physics question. Gauss is the opposite example. Gauss is a prime, amazing mathematician who also thought beautiful mathematical ideas must have some physical meaning, even though he was centered in mathematics. So it, it was already discovered by the, t by the time of Gauss that there are other kinds of geometries other than Euclidean ones. There are some geometries for which the angles of a triangle don't add up to 180. So these were, when you have curvature in space, you wouldn't get this uh, Euclidean geometry that suggests that the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. So he actually did an experiment. He thought, if I go on top of three mountains and look to the, towards the other mountain, so there will be three mountains, each one of them forms the vertex of a triangle, and if you connect them, you get a triangle. And you can measure the angles just by looking at the other side of the mountain to, to the other peak, and the angle they make from your sight, he measured. So he went to the three mountains to measure these three angles and see if they add up to 180 degrees. He assumed that the light goes the straight line. So therefore, based on this, he was trying to measure whether our universe was curved. So he was, he was motivated to ask this question purely from mathematics. No physical motivation. Just like math is elegant, it exists, so maybe our universe behaves like that. No other motivation, just elegance of mathematics. To his disappointment, he found the angles add up to 180 degrees. <clears throat> At least to the accuracy of his measurement. But actually, he was on the right track, it turns out. It had to wait a few, uh, another century before it was actually realized. I will come back to it. But before that, Maxwell came up and he, he unified what physicists had found in the context of electricity and magnetism in terms of beautiful equations, which we now call the Maxwell's equations, which predicted that there is light, namely electric and magnetic fields, which propagate with the speed of light actually is what we mean by light. And then again, there's this mathematician, Riemann. So Riemann, which generalized this notion of non-Euclidean geometry to a much more broader class, noticed that you can have dimensions, not just two and three dimensions, but higher dimensions, and you can have interesting geometry. So he began to think whether you can use Riemannian geometry to, to unify electricity and magnetism in particular. Again, he was motivated purely from mathematics, not from physics, but he believed that beautiful math must have beautiful physics application. Well, again, the accomplishment of, uh, of, of Riemann had to wait for Einstein's discovery that indeed Riemannian geometry was crucial in describing Newton's gravity in a more accurate fashion. So Einstein discovered that, that you will have a much more elegant and symmetric theory if, you're, if you describe the universe, not in terms of a flat space, 
but in terms of a curved space and having planets or uh, objects creating curvature where they are and the, the other objects following straight paths will look like they are bent because they are following these curvature. The curvature of the space and time affects the trajectory of, of uh, particles and light. Indeed, this was what Gauss was after, in a sense. So Riemann made up, made up this other theory, which later got applied by Einstein to the real world. So we see this interaction between mathematicians and physicists. And underlying it is the belief that good mathematics, deep mathematics, will have good and interesting physics application, as we have seen examples here. And later, Kaluza and Klein tried to use Einstein theory to unify gravity, which was part of Einstein's theory, with electricity and magnetism by introducing extra dimensions. So we have three spatial dimensions, we have time, and Kaluza and Klein introduced an extra dimension, which was a circle. So they introduced an extra circle at each point in space and time. So they tried to describe whether or not you can get Maxwell's theory, and they came up with a toy model, a kind of a model, in which it did have electricity and magnetism as part of gravity in one higher dimension. So going to higher dimension, this abstraction, a mathematical abstraction of introducing extra dimension allowed to unify electricity and magnetism. The aesthetics of physicists requires that we unify and simplify the ideas. We don't want to have this force, that force, this thing, that thing. We want to have one thing. We want to unify as much as possible. And sometimes to do that, we have to abstract things and going away from what we are used to, like introducing extra dimensions and going away from Euclidean geometry. And all these ideas of mathematics kind of help us in abstracting our ideas in a way to unify them. Now, this brings me to my area of research, which is string theory. So the aim of the string theory is indeed to unify fundamental forces and particles into one framework. It tries to describe the smallest possible scale, which is trillionth of a trillionth of the size of an atom, all the way to the biggest size available, which is our universe. It tries to have a unified principle to describe all the possible phenomena in the universe. The basic postulate for string theory is that the fundamental entities making up our universe are not particles, not point particles, but extended objects like strings or like membranes, which have extensions, not just like a point. So if you think about strings uh, as replacing particles, so if you think about uh, the proton made of three quarks, each quark is itself is viewed as a kind of a string, but of course to see that we have to zoom in because these are very, very tiny strings. They are these, these tiny loops which are the entities. So from far away, they just look like a point. But if you zoom in, go near it, and really look, look, look closer, you can see a size and, and then you would be able to see these extended objects that we were predicting. Now, have we seen these objects in the experiments? I'm afraid not yet. So why do we believe there are these objects even though we haven't seen them? The reason is it's really the only framework where we can have a consistent unification of Einstein's theory of gravity with quantum mechanics. We know quantum mechanics is true. That is describing the physics as a microscopic scale. Einstein's gravity was very powerful in explaining large scale things. And so when you bring them together and try to describe it together, it turns out particle physics doesn't work well. You need extended objects like strings to resolve the inconsistency between Einstein's theory of gravity and quantum mechanics. The microscopic world and the macroscopic world clash. And they are resolved, this clashing is resolved in the context of replacing point particles with extended objects like strings. So strings you can think about as loops that they come together and they form, interact with each other by two loops coming and forming one loop, 
or if you wish, go backwards in time and one loop splitting to two, this interaction between strings underlies all the interaction between particles that we see. Indeed, all the particles are unified into one string with different excitations of string, different vibration of strings, or different situation the string is situated at, gives you, we believe, all the possible particles we have seen. So it unifies all the particles and all the forces into a picture like this, which is called the pair of pants diagram, because if you put it together, it looks like a pair of pants. So <coughs> this area is very mathematical, and it involves many abstract ideas. Not only we have to do what Kaluza and Klein did in adding one extra dimension, we actually have to add six extra dimensions in string theory. So instead of three spatial dimensions, we have nine spatial dimensions. So these extra abstraction we see. But, we are, but they seem to be inconsistent, you might think, because we don't see them. We have only three spatial directions. So what happened to the extra six dimensions? Well, the belief is that they are very tiny. So to see them, you actually have to zoom in to the particular part of space. So at each point in space, you have these tiny little space, like circles or spheres, which are so small, in everyday experiments, we average over them because we can't see them with, with our measurements, because our measurements are not refined enough to probe that short a distance. So this is another abstraction to go from three dimension to nine dimension. So you can roughly speaking think at every point in space, there are these extra spheres that are so tiny that we don't see them around. So it looks like a plane, but actually there are these little things around at each point. So I could go on to talk about the mathematics of string theory more. And I'm afraid that would probably confuse people who are not necessarily studied that subject. But there is one misconception that I want to clarify, and that's really my main aim in this talk. The misconception is physics has a lot of math, which is correct, but the misconception comes to say math is too complicated to understand, and therefore physics is one of those complicated things to understand. And this actually is not quite true. It turns out basic ideas of, math of mathematics are very simple. They may be hiding under the symbols and extensions and generalizations and abstractions, but the main core of mathematical ideas are simple. And so are physical ideas. So my aim here is to illustrate that you don't need complicated math or complicated looking physics to describe phenomena. And I would like to convince you of that by giving you examples from very simple ideas and in particular, I would like to use mathematical puzzles to initiate the, the unraveling of ideas of how the laws of the universe work through examples. So deep physical ideas have deep uh, mathematical uh, principles underlying them, and this connection can be best exemplified based on puzzles that I would like to do. As I have been explaining, symmetries have been a, one of the profound ideas in physics. And so you might think, what is this abstract physics symmetry? And what does that word mean? And so on. I would like to give you a puzzle. But I need your cooperation, because I'm going to ask you questions, if you don't mind. So, so the first puzzle is the following. We have two containers. One has a white paint, and one has a green paint with exactly the same volume. White paint and green paint are all equal, OK? And then we do a little mixture between them. So to see that, you take a cup, you fill it with the green paint. You pour it into the white paint. You stir it. And then you take the same amount from the mixture and pour it back into the green one. You stare it again, of course. And then you put the cup down and ask, 
which container has the higher concentration of the other color? Does the green paint have more white in it or the white paint has more green in it? So I would like to ask this question from the audience here. How many of you think the white paint has more green in it? You can raise your hand, please. How many think that the green has more white? How many think they are exactly equal? Okay, very good. So now I will illustrate this. In fact, the majority of you thought that the green, the white has more green in it. And I think that would, that would have been also my guess originally uh, because of the following reason. You would say, look, when you take a green and pour it into the white, it's pure green. So it really green goes there. But then you stir it and you get a mixture. So you have, from the mixture, you get a white and a green mix and pour it back. So it's not pure white. So you might think that there's more green in the white. And that turns out not to be the case, as I will try to illustrate it. But what, why am I showing this here? It is because it has to do with symmetry and conservation laws. Symmetry in this case is kind of obvious. You have a white and a green, exactly the same volume. There's a symmetry between them. You can exchange them. It's just white versus green. They just have exactly the same volume. And there is a conservation law. The total amount of volume doesn't change of each one, right? So this can now be used to show that they must have exactly the same amount of concentration without doing any fancy calculation. Why is that? Well, you start with a fixed amount of volume which are equal. At the end, when you pour one and the other, the volume is still the same because whatever you poured, you poured back, right? The volume is the same. Now, if you unmix them, the green and the white, and the white and the green must have exactly the opposite amount so that when you swap them, you get back the original volumes. So they must have exactly the same volume because the total green and the total white were equal, and the total volume didn't change. So I will try to, it may sound like too hard to, to say it, but it's easier to see it, so I will just unmix it. You see, the amount of green must have swapped to the other side because the total volume is the same, so you swap them back. Now, you might think this is hocus pocus, but let me actually convince you this is a really simple idea. So let me illustrate it by a deck of cards. You have black cards and red cards. Ten black cards, ten red cards. And you take a few of one card and put it into the other and mix them, and then take the same amount and back and put it there. And you ask whether the red deck has more black in it or the black one has more red in it. And this is exactly similar to this. So you take three of the red and put it among the black deck and then mix them. And then take again three and then mix them. And then the question is, which one has more? Do you think the red has more black or the black has more red? It's exactly the same puzzle. But in this case, it's kind of obvious, right? Because you have 10 cards. You have 10 red cards and 10 black cards. So whatever is missing from the red is in the black, and whatever is missing from the black is in the red, and they must be exactly the same. This is the same puzzle that we originally thought very differently. So this deconfuses us. Symmetry deconfuses us. So symmetry is very powerful. As you can see, it deconfuses us. It is not like, oh yeah, you know, this is a symmetric shape, oh, boring, boring. No, no, it's very powerful, very powerful. Now, I'll give you other examples of symmetry. Aristotle, amazing guy. He had beautiful ideas, but some of his ideas were not necessarily correct. For example, he thought heavier objects fall faster. You know, I don't blame him. I would have thought the same myself. You take a heavy stone and a tiny stone, you would think heavy stone goes fast, falls faster if you drop them at the same time. Of course, uh, we know that's not true, as Galileo famously pointed out, that all objects fall at the same rate as long as you ignore the resistance of the air. If you take a big or a small object, if you drop them from the same height, they hit the ground at the same time. How did he do it? Experiment. Science is experiment. So he experimented. And he checked it and he convinced himself that this is the case. Believe it or not, at that time, scientists did not believe as much in experimentation. 
They said, you have to dirty your hand to figure this out. What is the reason? You have to give us a reason why heavier objects and lighter objects fought the same rate. He said, I have experimented. He said, no, you have to give us a reason why it has to be the same. The scientific methodology has changed so much. This sounds so ridiculous in today's mindset. But at that time, the scientists were really interested in not messing up their hands with experiments. They really wanted thought, a thought explanation of why they fall together. So Galileo had, poor Galileo, in addition to the experiment, he actually had to come up with a reason why it's the case. And he devised this beautiful experiment, thought experiment. He said, take three bricks, exactly the same shape, the same size, etc., and the same height, and drop them at the same time. Which one falls first? By symmetry, they all fall together. That was kind of obvious. Symmetry being exactly the same object, you can switch one to the other, they're symmetric. So of course they fall at the same time. So he, Right? That's obvious. Everybody say, yeah, yeah, we know that. So what? What is that telling us? He said, well, do you agree that if I move these bricks at the same height, does it matter? They say, no, uh, we know that it's kind of obvious. If you move them and drop them, nothing changes as long as they're the same height. He said, good. So if you agree with that, we can move them further and make them even touch. Does it matter? No. Why should it matter if they touch or don't touch? And then he said, ah, this guy is twice bigger than that guy. <laughs> so heavier objects and lighter objects fall together. And they were agreeing. They had nothing to say. They said, yeah, you're right. So this shows the symmetry. Simple ideas like symmetry can really deconfuse us. We should not underestimate the power of it in explaining something like this. Why were we confused to think heavier objects fall first? Because of psychology, you know, if you have a big stone, you watch out, it doesn't fall on your foot. You don't care about this little one, right? It's kind of, we pay attention to the bigger object more. So somehow, this gets us confused, and this deconfuses us. As beautiful as symmetry is in physics, breaking it is more beautiful. It's hard to believe. How could you break? Breaking is a bad thing to do. Why do you want to break it? No, no, no. This is not breaking it by hand. This is breaking by itself. You start with a symmetric situation and somehow symmetry is gone. Just like that. How could that happen? You have a symmetric thing. How could it disappear? I'll give you an example. Suppose we have four cities on the corners of a square. City A, B, C, and D. And uh, we have a... Uh, somebody or governor or something wants to build highway to connect all the cities together so that you can get from, by highways, you can get from any city to any other city. It does not have to be a direct route. You just want to be able to follow some path to go from any city, A, B, C, D, to any other city. You want to make the total length of the highway minimum because it costs, naturally. So the question is, what is the shortest highway system which these four points on a square get connected, these four cities? Now, I'll give you some options to see what you guys think. How many of you think this is the answer? Raise your hand if you believe so. How many of you think this is the answer? How many of you think this is the answer? which is the same as this, of course, because you can move the road with the same length. Well, uh, how many of you think none of these is the answer? Good, good, okay. So, <laughs> Actually, this is the answer. This looks totally crazy. Look, what is this? This highway system looks very crazy. Why is it crazy? Well, you connect, first of all, you build a highway connecting the, these A and C together first. And then you make a 120 degree angle and connect it to the other one and then branch off like that. That is the shortest. It doesn't sound right. It sounds wrong. Why do we think it sounds wrong? It sounds wrong because it breaks the symmetry. You see, it does not have the symmetries of the square. To get from the city A to city C is faster than getting from A to B. From A to B is now longer, even though they were both on the corners of the square. 
that's bizarre. So we started with a symmetric situation, four cities on a square, and the highway system, which minimizes the length, is not, does not enjoy the symmetries of the square. Symmetry gone by itself. We didn't, we didn't break it by hand. Spontaneously broken. It turns out many things in physics work because of that. Magnetism. Mag magnets are amazing, right? You have, if you have played with magnets and filings and iron filings and all that, it's amazing how the magnets work. Magnets work because the, the spins of particles that create this magnet are all aligned in some direction, some bizarre thing. So you're breaking a symmetry. In fact, early Greek philosophers argued uh, first that Earth is round. Well, they had already found that Earth is, they had already checked, the, measured actually the radius of the Earth by measuring the, the length of the shadow as you go away from the equator. So they already kind of knew that the Earth is round and they measured the radius to good accuracy. But they also had the picture that they wanted to explain why the Earth is not moving. Right? Earth is round, but it's not moving. At least it didn't look like it's moving. So they had to explain it. So they came up with an amazing argument as follows. They say, Earth is not moving because if it moved, it breaks the symmetry of a sphere. They said that suppose you have the Earth right there, and suppose it moves. Well, then it picks a direction, right? As soon as you pick a direction, you break the spherical symmetry. So it's not allowed to move. It breaks the symmetry. Therefore, Earth doesn't move because it doesn't like to break the symmetry. That was their explanation. It's amazing that the Greeks were thinking so abstractly about symmetries and connecting with reality. Why the Earth doesn't move and so on. Really, really a, few thousand, a couple of thousand years ahead of their time, really. Well, our favorite friend, Mr. Aristotle, said, no, not a good argument. I don't like it. He said, why? Why don't you like this argument? It's so elegant. It says, symmetry does, tells you that the earth doesn't move. It's so beautiful. No, it's not a good argument. He said, suppose you put a person in the middle of a circle, right at the center, and put food on a circle around it, a loaf of bread around it. Okay, it's all symmetric. This, the bread is exactly a circle around this person. Do you think this guy is going to stand there forever? <laughs> no way. He's going to go and grab a food. He doesn't care if it breaks symmetry, okay? That was his argument. He gave this argument that you would go and get the food. It doesn't care. Symmetry, no symmetry. Sometimes symmetry gets broken spontaneously. You pick a direction and break it, okay? Now, you might say, well, what a, bad, what a funny example. This example is exactly equivalent to the mechanism where we understand particles, as I will come back to a second. So this actually is the modern explanation of how we explain how we get our masses. It's really, really remarkable, and I will come to it in a second. But before that, um, I would like to say something else. You see, we live on the Earth, and Earth by and large is symmetric if you rotate 180 degrees, 360 degrees around us, right? So therefore, our body should be symmetric under the rotation because we have a symmetry around us. But somehow evolution has broken that symmetry. Look, our eyes are in the front. They are not around us. It would have been nicer if it looked like this, maybe. <laughs> That would be much more symmetrical. But it's not. It's broken. Why, why did evolution break the symmetry? Why, why is there eyes in the front? You know why? I think we have to grab the food, and the food is in front of us. <laughs> so in some sense, evolution itself, evolution itself responds to breaking of the symmetry. And our body, on our body, we have a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Our eyes are in the front. And as I mentioned, one of the basic principles of how the particles work and how the particles get their masses is what we call the Higgs mechanism. 
this thing that you may have heard about a few years ago called the God particle, the Higgs particle, it turns out to be nothing but the following picture. At every point in space, you can think of having a potential which looks like a hill, this hill that I'm showing over there, and if you have a hill which has a peak at the top and the valley at the bottom, there's a circular symmetry that if you rotate this, it's circularly symmetric. But if you put a ball on the top of, the, of that hill, it will not stay there for a long. It will fall down and go to the bottom of the valley. That is spontaneous symmetry breaking, and it's exactly the same as the situation as the one Aristotle said. If you think about the guy at the center of that circular symmetry, and where the food is at the lowest height, which is the minimum energy. So minimum energy is where the food is. And indeed, we are there, we are at the bottom of it, and that's how we get our mass. And that mechanism explains how we get our mass. So spontaneous symmetry breaking is crucial for understanding how particles behave and how the Higgs particle comes about. Now, I want to switch a little bit and tell you that you might think that simple mathematics, you know, primary school even, level mathematics is kind of boring and we should get to really, you know, tough mathematics. But actually, I would like to convince you of otherwise. Simple mathematics could have amazingly non-trivial consequences. So here is an example. Consider the Earth and consider the equator. So that white band over there is the equator of the Earth. And we measured the temperature, suppose, around the equator. And somebody asks this following silly question. Could it be, could it be that at, any, at some particular moment, the temperature at one point on the equator is exactly the same as the temperature opposite point on the equator, opposite across the center of the Earth? Could it be that the temperature are exactly the same at two opposite points? Well, of course, it could happen. You might say, why not? But the question is, does it always have to happen? Well, let me come back to that later, actually. This is a different one first. <laughs> uh, so let me first do a different puzzle before I come to that. We do something else which has to do with the equator still. We first, before we do the temperature measurement, we, 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 we wrap a belt around the equator, and then we unwind it. So take a belt wrap around the big belt, around the equator, and open it up. So you see that white belt there. Okay, it's a big belt. And then what do we do? Well, we add one meter to it. So we have a belt plus one meter, okay? Then we wrap it again around the Earth. Now, because we added one meter, it's not going to be tight. It's going to be slightly above it, right? How many of you think that the, the amount that's going to go above it is like one meter? How many think it's like less uh, or more than one centimeter? How many think it's like really tiny, like less than a, less than a micron? Okay. So the majority, and indeed I would have had exactly the same intuition, the majority think that this should be very tiny. You just added one meter to this huge belt and you expect the whole thing to come out you know, in some height. No, it's going to be tiny, of course. Not so. How do we show this? Simple math. The simple math is that if you want to find that x, x the, the amount that comes up higher, you do simple math about what is the perimeter of a circle, namely, you start with the fact that the perimeter of a circle, the perimeter of the Earth originally is 2 pi times the radius. That's where you start. You add the 1 meter to it, so that's 2 pi r plus 1, and that's the same as 2 pi times the new radius. So 2 pi times the radius plus x, which is this r plus this little x, is the new radius, so 2 pi times that is the new perimeter of this circle. So you see that the 2 pi r between the left and the right hand side of this equation cancel out. So you get the 1 is equal to 2 pi x. So you learn x is 1 over 2 pi, which is about 16 centimeters. 16 centimeters. So amazing. Simple math. Really simple math, right? But it shows that our intuition can, 
gained from just simple calculations. So, so just knowing math is not enough. We have to apply it. And application of math leads to sometimes unexpectedly powerful statements. I was teaching this to one of my, uh, in one of my classes, and one of the students said, um, what if you pull it all from one side instead of uniformly putting the belt around it? So okay, you can do it. Maybe you get, I don't know, half a meter or something like that. And actually, he said, he said that he has calculated it, and he gets a different number. And actually, he was right. The number he got was 121 meters. Now, um, <coughs> this, looks, this re needs a little bit more sophisticated math, it turns out. But the math is uh, something that Newton would have done anyhow. So, so it's, it needs a little bit of a calculus. But it shows you that you can go next step and, and actually push what you think your intuition and correct it really bad. Adding one meter, you can raise this whole thing up by 121 meter. You can have a skyscraper under it. It's amazing. It's quite unintuitive, quite unintuitive. For those who know a bit calculus, I would, I would suggest that you try to get this number. So I come to the power of continuity, which is what I was about to say when I switched off the discussion about the temperature business. We are trying to measure the temperature, and we are interested on the same equator again, but asking if the temperature on the opposite sides of the equator, can they be possibly be the same at some, at some points? The statement actually is that you go and measure it, and you find that no matter when you measure it, at any time there are exactly two points opposite on the equator which have the same temperature. If you change the time, the place where the temperatures are equal changes. And there may be even more than one, but at least there's at least one point in which the temperature on the opposite points are exactly the same. And now you might say, wow, this is an amazing principle of physics. We have to explain why the temperature adjusts itself to do this. This is an amazing thing. It turns out that the only aspect of physics you need is that the temperature varies continuously as you go around the equator. If the temperature doesn't jump up and down, if it just gradually goes up and down, it will always be the case that there are two points opposite on the equator which have the same exact temperature. And to see that, so consider the opposite points I label by theta and minus theta at the opposite points. Suppose their temperature were not equal. Suppose one is higher than the other. Consider the difference between the temperatures of one side minus the other side. Then it would be positive if it's not equal, right? Let's say one side is bigger, that side minus the other side is a positive. And com consider this function as you go around the circle and you come to the opposite point, then you are taking the difference of the temperature this side minus the other side, now it's negative. So you go from a positive to a negative, gradually. But positive to a negative, you cannot jump. You have to cross zero somewhere. So therefore, at the place where you cross the zero, the temperatures are the same, because that's the difference. So continuity will tell you that must happen. In other words, you consider this function, which is the difference of temperatures, and uh, the function is that if you go to the opposite points, the function goes to its minus, and therefore, wherever you start, for example, if you start here, you go to the opposite point, it goes from minus to plus, which so should cross zero somewhere, and when it crosses at that angle, you have exactly the same temperature. Now, um, you open up the TV news and they report that today it was found that the temperature and pressure, not just temperature, temperature and pressure at two opposite points on the Earth were exactly the same, but the points varied. And then no matter when you ask, the, the, the reports came that the temperature and pressures were equal, exactly, exactly two opposite points on the Earth. It turns out that that also follows from continuity of the temperature and pressure. So it's not physics, really, other than continuity. So continuity, simple ideas of con mathematics, continuity, which of course underlies physical principles, which are continuous, explains these facts without, without too many complicated equations. Simple ideas. Now, this next example is, is a bit more complicated. So I'm afraid. So this might be, I might lose some of the audience in explaining this. But it's a, little, it's a little fancy, so I really want to show it anyhow. It's called gravitational lensing. So as I explained, Einstein 
found that the universe is curved. It's not flat. And the light bends. So then when the light bends, you could have some source of light where the light goes one way and bends, and it goes another way and bends, and you're over there and watching it, a, a source giving you two different ways to get the same picture. So you look that way, you say, aha, uh -huh, it's coming from there. You say, no, 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 it's coming from there because the two lights are coming to you from different paths. So this is called gravitational lensing, and this could happen by having some massive objects in the middle which bends the light as the light goes around. So, um, so these are the kind of pictures. So for example, you can have a faraway galaxy and the light is getting to us on the Earth from different paths. The number of images that you get from a given galaxy might be more than one. It might give this way, that way, it might be third way. So you're looking at the picture of the sky and you say, oh, look at that one, oh, look at that one, oh, look at that one. They might be the same thing. Surprise, that's amazing. Could this really happen? Yes, it can. Look at this picture right there. That picture over there, you might think they're different objects, but actually those blue circles are the same objects called quasars, and those orange circles are the same galaxy. So looking at the sky and taking a picture will fool us this way because these lights will come from different paths. This is an actual picture, so it's not a, it's not a cartoon, so actually you can see this. In fact, uh, there is an amazing theorem which says that if you do not block the lights that come to you, of course you can block a light, but suppose you don't block any light, the number of images you get is always odd. Either one image, three images, five images, seven images, nine images, but not two, four, or six. Always you get an odd number of images. Like here you get three and five. And also, exactly just less than half of the images are inverted. So you get, for example, if you have five images, you get three of them which are right side up and then two of them which are flipped. Wow, that's an amazing fact about Einstein's theory. How do you show this? Much simpler. You don't need any fancy physics. Just continuity. The fact that you get odd number of images with this property follows from continuity only. Yes. Now, the argument gets a little bit more abstract, but really is basically that same temperature I showed you. It's really at the same level of this, slightly more abstract. So I'll try to say it. I may lose some of you. But believe me, the idea is as simple as that idea of the continuity I told you about. So the number of gravitational images is, is less than half of them is inverted. And the way you think about it is that you look at, the, you look at this star or galaxy or whatever, and then you look at the Earth. So you think about the light ray. The light ray gives you a, 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 a map from one to the other, points from one place to the other. In particular, if you think about a sphere around the star or galaxy, and a huge sphere which passes through the Earth, whose center is where the galaxy was, any light ray which passes from first one will hit the second one. So therefore, you get what mathematicians call a map from this small sphere around this galaxy to this humongous sphere which includes the Earth. Each point goes to another point. Each point goes to another point just by following the light. So we have a map from one little sphere to this huge sphere. Now, what do we know about this map? Well, if there is nothing between us, if there is no mass or whatever, the light will go straight lines, right? So it maps every point on the sphere to the same point on the opposite sphere, in the bigger sphere. So this map is what mathematicians call the same map, self-map or identity map. It doesn't do anything. It takes the same point to the same point. Kind of boring, right? Now, what if we put some stuff in the middle? Well, it turns out before I do that, I want to draw your attention to the following fact. If you ask how many points, if you ask how many points go to a particular point like here, you ask it's exactly one. In other words, there's only one point that goes to this particular point. If there was some light that had come differently, 
Like if it had gone like a different path and coming here, there would have been more than one point. But if it's just straight lines, there's exactly one point. You can count the number of points that go to a particular point, and it turns out that that number cannot jump. Well, not exactly right. It actually can jump, but it cannot jump. When it jumps, it always jumps in pairs, and these pairs come with opposite signs. So let me try to illustrate that picture, what that means. So you look at this, and you try to put matter in the middle. So as you put the matter in the middle, you, it's, you add matter in the, where the galaxy is, and gradually it's as if that sphere around the it's as if that sphere around the galaxy gets distorted, changes shape a little bit. You can think of it that way. And then if you now take straight lines, the straight lines will now go from, you see, just have one point hitting there, and that goes in the plus direction. But if you go a little further, in the diff if the Earth was somewhere else, you would have had three points. And if you were somewhere else, you would have five points. You see, each time you pass one of these cusps, you get pairs, one, three, five, and so on. And you get plus and minuses because you go back and forth. Each line is kind of curling back and forth. So if you go in a particular direction around the circle, you see that sometimes you have to go backwards to get the same point. So that's why they are inverted. So you see, you get two minuses and three pluses. The two minuses correspond to inverted images. And three pluses are upside, right side up. So these simple pictures illustrate these amazing facts about, about the universe. So now, I want to show you some examples about the power of mathematical abstraction. I told you, I'll give you a hint, I told you that um, Einstein had to introduce three space and one time, and Kaluza and Klein added one more space, and string theory said, no, there are six more spaces, so we're adding dimensions. It's abstract, what's going on? But sometimes abstraction is necessary to solve a puzzle, and this is an example. Suppose you have four ants, and they are moving on a plane, and suppose they pairwise collide. Will these ants collide? So let me explain what the situation is. You have four ants on a plane. They are going at a constant velocity. They're not speeding up, slowing down. They're just going at constant velocity, but in different directions. So their trajectories will cross. Their trajectories will cross. But one may get there first, and the other might get second, so they may not actually collide if one gets there first, and so on. Suppose we know out of these four ants, all pairs collide, except for two we don't know, the last two. Right? So let me just go back just to make sure that we catch it again, so where we started. We started with this. We started with four ants, and pairwise they collide. They're all going at a constant velocity, with different speeds, but constant velocity. They're all colliding, as you can see, except we are asking whether or not these last two will collide or not. Okay? Now, I want to ask you a question. How many of you think they will collide? How many think they don't have to collide? How many... Well, okay, so there's no other third option, sorry. <laughs> I was going to invent something, but there's nothing to say. So, so actually, um, well, they will collide. Why do they collide? You have to have an abstraction. So if you go and solve the equation, it looks a bit complicated, but there's a way to do it without actually writing a single equation, just drawing a picture. So with a picture, you can actually show they have to collide. But how do we do that? This is a two-dimensional problem. It turns out we have to introduce an extra dimension, time. We have to add time to solve this problem. This problem is not on a plane, really. It's on a plane plus time. So this problem is not two-dimensional. It is three-dimensional. OK, what does time buy for us? OK, the time is passing like clicking. What, what does it have to do with ants colliding? What is this? Well. Let's just think about it. Suppose you draw an axis which is a time, vertically, coming off the plane. The ants going at a constant velocity, if you 
trajectory, if you see at which time where they are, you will actually get a line in three dimensions. Straight line, because they're going at a constant velocity. So ants going at a constant velocity means each ant gives you a line in space and time. Straight line. Now, when we say that the trajectory is crossed, but the actual ants cross, what does it mean? It means that they're at the same time at the same point. Which means in this two dimension plus one, in this three dimensional sense, their actual paths will actually collide. The lines intersect. Oh, that's simple Euclidean geometry, right? So two ants collide if the corresponding lines in three dimension collide. Is that clear? So now we have four ants. One, two, three, four. Ants one and three and four collide. Ants two, three, and four collide. And we we're asking if ants one and two collide, right? If ants one and three collide means that their two lines forms a plane because they co collide, the lines intersect. So one and three collide, one and three are on the same plane, one and four collide, one and four are on the same plane, three and four collide, three and four are on the same plane, therefore one, three and four, their lines are in the same plane. Is that clear? Two, three and four, for the same reason, they are on the same plane. But you cannot have two different planes having three and four, they must be the same plane. And since their angles are different, they must collide. They must intersect. Is that clear? So it's just simple Euclidean geometry. And so this, this abstract, the time, yes. One, one. And so one, you can one, see the planes one, actually have one, to collide because of the planes that they form. One, one. So these two planes are the same, and therefore these two ants, one and two, are on the same plane, and therefore they must collide. So anyhow, the abstraction is necessary in this case, at least it simplifies the explanation. You don't have to write the equation, just a simple picture of lines. That one kind of we know already. We don't need any fancy math. One of the amazing things we have discovered in string theory, and in fact in mathematics, as I, we, may, we, may, we may hear also about it, is what we call in physics duality. Things which don't look like each other, but somehow magically they are the same. Remarkable, it's like kind of, it's hard, it's the, the experience of seeing that is, is amazing. It's very much uh, eye-opening that you can have two completely different systems looking the same. Reminds you of this drawing of Escher. Like, um, if you look at this drawing of the field, you have different parts capturing different things. Like, on the left, you have the white, day sky. On the right, you have the dark black sky. On the left, you have these black birds flying. On the right, you have the white birds flying. And somehow, they kind of become the same. You see the white birds becoming the sky on the left, and the left birds becoming the sky on the right. And the fields down there are becoming the two birds when you go from up to down and down to up. So, it's quite beautiful, and in this sense, in some sense, is what the kind of thing we see in physics, the dualities, that they kind of morph together into one consistent framework. So elegantly and seamlessly, you cannot see where it happened. It kind of goes together. This is one of the breads and butters of string theories. It's one of the amazing things we have discovered, and we don't know why the universe works this way. We don't know why we are so lucky to have this all, all around us in the context of the universe, but it seems to be true. So uh, my, my next puzzle is about this, the power of duality, I, that you have to kind of change perspective, like going from left to right, or some perspective changing. And so this puzzle has, is the following. You take a, a meter stick, one meter long, and you put 20 ants, I love ants, I guess. You put 20 ants on it, and these ants go at the same speed, one centimeter per second. You have one meter, 100 centimeters, and you put 20 ants on the meter stick, and they go one, meter, one centimeter per second. But the question is which direction they go? Well, some of them may go from left to right, and some may go from right to left. Okay, what if they come and collide? Well, if they collide, they, do, they, they reverse direction. So if they come and collide, they go the other way. And if they collide the other guy, they go back. So they collide and just kind of like a 
zigzagging back and forth between ants, okay? Your challenge is the following. I give you 20 ants, you put them on the meter stick. Oh, I forgot to say one important fact. Uh, the ants might go all the way to the right and the meter stick ends. What happens then? Well, they fall off, unfortunately. So, so th the universe ends, it's just one meter. So uh, your challenge is to find where you put these 20 ants and which directions they should go so that it takes the longest time for the last ant to fall off this meter stick. Is the challenge clear? So we have these ants colliding back and forth. You see that blue one, for example, going back and forth as soon as it collides and so on. Is that clear? And unfortunately, as you see on the ends of it, they just fall off. So where do we put them and what do we do uh, to, to maximize the time the last ant falls off? Well, you might think this is a very interesting thing. You have to put the particle positions to kind of collide, bounce and forth. But it turns out the answer is much simpler, again, by thinking about dualities. To take the duality, you see, I have colored them in such a way to confuse you, to give identity to the ants. But suppose all the ants were black, what would it look like? Nothing looks the same except they are black. Well, actually, if you look at it more carefully, you get confused. Are they going through each other or are they going back? Or does it matter? You cannot say the difference, can you? You cannot say if they're actually colliding or passing through each other because I colored them all black. Is that clear? Therefore, you might as well, the situations are identical to whether they collide or not collide. There's a duality between Bouncing back and forth are not even caring they are bouncing. The picture looks the same. Therefore, you just put one ant at one end of the meter stick and say, go that way, you don't care what about, about anything else. The rest don't matter. Is that clear? So again, the power of duality and changing the perspective into all blacks. Now, finally, as a last example, I want to tell you that, you know, we scientists are very serious people. We take experiments very seriously. We, we, we don't know the answer to questions. We look in the sky, we look at what's happening. We take measurements. We come up with a theory to see if it's, it makes sense. We look again more, maybe it works. We check again and again and again and make sure that it always works. This is the scientific methodology. We are very careful not to give up in checking. So here, this is the point of this uh, last puzzle. We have examples, which are, you can think about ex experiments. We formulate a general principle based on examples, and we come up with arguments why and how it works. And we again check whether it really does. So this is the, the puzzle, the analogous, analogous puzzle. We take a circle, and uh, it's a green inside. You take two points on the boundary, on the circle, and you connect them. How many regions do we get? How many think it's two? Everybody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, it's two. You see, um, it's one, two, right. So uh, this one was not a puzzle, actually. This is a simple one. So um, no, no trick questions yet. How about if we take three points? So two points, we got two regions. How about three points? How many think you get four? Yes, thank you. So three points, we get four regions. So we are just taking some random points, generic points, some not, not, nothing very special, symmetric or anything, just take random points and connect them and see how many regions you get. It's kind of a boring game, but well, why not? Let's do it and see what happens. So three points, we get four regions. How about four points? How many think it's eight? Beautiful. Four points is eight. Uh-huh. Two gives you two. Three points gives you four regions. And four points gives you eight regions. Are you getting the pattern? Let's do one more. We add one more point. 
Now it's getting really messy. It's hard to count, but I did it for you. <laughs> so indeed, your naive guess will be true. Two points give you two regions, three points, four regions, four points, eight regions, five points, 16 regions. Do you get the pattern? How many get the pattern? Excellent, excellent. So this is the point, that we experiment, we see the pattern, we come up with a theory. But we have to explain why the theory works. Each time we add the point, it doubles. Why does it double? Well, it's kind of obvious, right? Because you take a point, you connect it, every region is either to the left or to the right. So there's a factor of two. So each additional thing divides the region to a factor of two. So it's of course it's a factor of two. You're wasting my time. It's of course a factor of two. What's this game? So that's the explanation. So if you add one more point, what, how many should we get? <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, this is disappointing. Uh, uh, so what happened? Well, explanation was wrong apparently somehow. Uh, it's 31, okay. This is, happens a lot to theorists, I have to tell you. <laughs> We, we, look at the, we look at the results, we come up with an amazingly elegant answer, it fits the data and so on, and then we do more experiments, it doesn't work, and then we say the whole thing was wrong, we come up with a better theory, okay? This is an example. If you don't believe me, go and do your own counting, that when you have six points, you get 31. If you have seven points, if you are curious, you get 57 points, not 64. So anyhow, the, the numbers get worse and worse, and uh, what is the actual formula? I, I write it here for people who are familiar with this notation. One plus n choose, if n is the number of points, the number of regions is one plus n choose two plus n choose four. And the funny thing is, if n is, if, uh, I should go here. So if n is less than, uh, if n is less than five, less than or equal to five, this, there's a theorem says that if you went all the way up to n, you get two to the power of n minus one. But it stops. So if this addition had continued, it would have been indeed the power of two. But it stops. And that's why this formula tricked us to think it's a power of two, but it's not. So, so I hope that I have conveyed the power of simple mathematical ideas in the context of physics. Even the most advanced ideas and mind-boggling things that you may hear in string theory are actually not difficult to understand in simple terms. Otherwise, we as humans would not have been able to understand them. We only understand simple things, and this is how it works. So don't get, don't get kind of disillusioned with when you hear some abstract, complicated looking things. The underlying ideas are always simple. So uh, thanks for listening to my talk. have time for, we will have time for a couple of questions. And I think there should be some microphones around here. There's one over there. Do we have any question? There has to be. <laughs> we have 15 or 1700 people in here. There must be someone <laughs> who has something. Yes, down here. Oh, wait for the microphone. It's coming there. Does that work? So I have a question about the belt around the Earth question. Yes. Because it seemed to me you raised it by 16 centimeters on both sides. We did what? Uh, it was 16 centimeters yes, yes, on yes. each side. Yes. And then you moved it, you squished it on yeah, the so, side. So the second part you mean. Yeah, yeah. So what I did the second part was that I wrapped the whole thing tightly around the Earth. Yeah, yeah. Except at one point I just, just take it and push it up. So it's going to be tight around the Earth everywhere except towards the end. So it's not circular anymore. It's not circular anymore. And I would have naively thought maybe one meter becomes a half a meter up or a little more maybe, but mm. I would not have naively thought it's 121 meters. It's yeah, surprised. Yeah. I was just stuck by 32, but that would be if it was still circular, right? It's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right, right. If you could, you could have, you're right. You could have, that would have been, 
You mean 32 centimeters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If this you keep it circular. That's right. If it was yeah. circular, it would be 32 centimeters. Mm -hmm. I want to make clear. I'm talking about 121 meters. Yeah. Yeah, not yeah. centimeters, so it's huge compared to the scale of 16 centimeters. Because you're distorting the circle. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, I suggest that all of you try it with your own belts. <laughs> <laughs> and see if you can do that in the, in, 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 in the pause later on. Okay, any other questions? I yeah. think we have time maybe for, for yeah. one more. Okay, I, it's I down I in this area here that all the questions are concentrating Hello. apparently. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. great. Uh, so I was wondering, do you think the nature of reality itself is simple and has simple explanations, or is it that we can only comprehend simple explanations and that's why we find them? Well, uh, of course, it's a very good question. I would, have, I would think that evidence points towards the fact that nature is simple. Otherwise, how could we even talk about Big Bang, the beginning of the universe, in terms of simple equations? Why? That's one of the most complicated things it should be, but simple. Atoms, simple. Why it should be? We don't know. The constituents are simple. Why? We don't know. So I think that it's hard to believe that the nature is not simple and we're getting these basic facts, the beginning of the universe, the structure of the matter, we can explain all those. So I think it points to the fact that the universe is simple, luckily for us. <laughs> yeah. One okay. last, last question down there. Uh, you were talking about uh, the entire all the fundamental forces uh, into one uh, framework, uh, right? Yes. Uh, is it proven that there is one singular framework or um, is it just something we theorize or idealize? Yes, the good question. So this is a question that physicists ask also. Uh, in fact, let me, let me backtrack that. Connection between physics and philosophy has changed over centuries. I mean, Greek philosophers mathematicians, and I would call them physicists in a sense. Uh, and if you look at the discussions during the beginning of quantum mechanics, it was a lot of philosophical discussions between Einstein and Bohr and all that amazing thing going on. Now, if you look at physicists today, you see much less discussion about philosophy, much less discussion. And in some sense, I think it's strange because Underlying a lot of our physical laws and so on lies philosophical underpinnings. In fact, in my opinion, physicists, theoretical physicists, are perhaps you could call amateur philosophers. They don't have formal training maybe as a philosopher, but they think in philosophical terms. One of them is related to the question you're asking. Why do we want all the forces to be unified into one? It may not. I mean, why? why? it looks more beautiful. Why is it called? What, what is the philosophical reason for that? What is the motivation for that? So these kind of things you cannot prove. Now, uh, you, can, you can also kind of connect it with when you unify the thing looks simpler. But I think, I think that even if it looked more complicated, we would like that. Like for example, Einstein's theory is not simpler than Newton's theory in terms of equations, much more difficult to solve. But we think it's better. It's in some sense unifies aspects of mass, inertial mass and gravitational mass to one object, and the price for that is that complicated equation. So I think it's not just enough to say we like simplicity. In some sense, we like unifying. You, we, we, want, we want unifying things. Why is some philosophical uh, mindset of human beings in some sense? And it has helped, served us well in science, so I think we are continuing that path. Okay, you will take a 10 minute break. There will be time for questions after the next talk. Let's thank Cameron again. Thank you.